uh, we have started, I can see. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to our January 2024 Lunch and Learn with the Iowa Geographic Information Council. And um, just so you know, we are recording this video, um, this webinar, and we will be making it available on the iJIC YouTube um, channel uh, after it's completed so you can share it or look at it again. Um, I Today we're going to be talking um, about working with ArcGIS Pro layouts and I am here today. I'm one of the presenters with my um, colleague Garrett who is hailing from Indiana. So he's an hour ahead of us. Um, so I want to welcome Garrett to our our uh, little monthly webinar series. Let's see here. This is weird to talk and be in control of the uh, have to pay attention to all the other stuff. All right, so um, so we're going to be talking about ArcGIS Pro layouts today. It's going to be um, a little bit of everything. So we're going to have some beginner stuff and some more advanced stuff. So we're hoping that uh, take with it and you'll find little pieces here or there that are um, informative and useful for you. Um, first of all, I want to say welcome. And um, I am Micah Cutler and Garrett. Garrett, did you want to say hi? <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm trying to get down to the screen that has the uh, mute and unmute on there. But hi, how everybody? How is everybody doing? Um, it'll be exciting to uh, get to talk about layouts with you. Cool. So um, Garrett and I both work for Schneider Geospatial. Um, many of you have heard of Schneider. Schneider is a, a large GovTech um, GIS company. A uh, picture here is of our uh, office in Ankeny, Iowa, and uh, Garrett works out of our headquarters in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, and specifically, who are Garrett and I, we are part of the st staff augmentation team. So what we do is we work for public and private organizations. We provide any kind of GIS support of whatever that organiz organization needs. So it could be something like data management. Um, it can be updating data layers. It can be map production. It can be um, GIS server and enterprise support. It can be um, in a leadership role with like kind of coordinating um, GIS activities and bringing different departments together, you know, basically whatever it is they they need. Um, we get to be kind of a jack of all trades, master of none, maybe. I don't know, but uh, it does allow us to touch into all kinds of parts of um, the software, the industry and uh, um, different parts of GIS, which I really, really appreciate. And so what we're going to talk about today is um, layouts. And I kind of threw together some of these topics. We're going to start in the beginning. Um, I know that we have a wide range of users in this um, webinar, and so we want to present information kind of from the beginning uh, and uh, not just jump right into the more advanced topics, um, but we will be getting to those. So before we really start talking about layouts, um, for those of you that know me, I've been doing this for a really, really long time, and um, I my background initially was in cartography. So I'm very much into good map design and um, making sure that things that are in a map that make a map legible and to most concise and and to you know give the right kind of information and i'm kind of aware that in the past 25 years there's been such a change in the industry and in geospatial information and how we present that information and so much of it has gone um, online with arcgis online and web maps and apps and just different ways of interacting with the data that sometimes working with layouts and things that are intended to maybe be a printed uh, material can seem a little archaic and so I want to go back to the beginning and just kind of fly through some stuff to remember for those people that maybe don't have as much experience working with layouts because maybe um, their job or um, their experience has mostly been in a web map or, or an online or data driven kind of environment. And so I, I have this little acronym that I've um, presented on before. So this is going to be familiar for um, some of you that it's kind of a checklist of things as you're putting together a map and what we'll be talking about today of things what you should include in a map and it kind of seems basic but sometimes when you're sitting down especially for those of you that are um, more uh, new to the industry um, you may not actually remember or uh, know all the things that should and shouldn't be um, included in a layout and i as with everything that we show today take it with a grain of salt this is just, you know, Micah's ideas, and you can uh, disregard those that you just don't even agree with. It won't bother me one bit. So the acronym I like to use is called Tall Dogs, 
And um, I actually started talking about this when I was in a graduate student at the South um, University of South Carolina. There was a geographic alliance there, and that's kind of where I latched onto this. But it, um, especially for me when I was a beginner, it kind of gave me a nice little checklist of things to remember to put on a map and to know when you might um, uh, to help you not forget some of the more important elements. I don't know about you, but I'm sure you've all looked at a map and wondered um, where the data came from or how old was the map or, you know, could you trust the source of the data, et cetera, et cetera. Or maybe you didn't even understand what it is you were looking at. So these are things that will help make your um, layout and your map readable, um, present the rec correct information in a way that will help people um, become good map readers. So obviously the first thing is title. Um, you want to basically, in as most concise possible way, kind of indicate what the map is showing, whether it's a theme or a location, um, maybe a little bit of both. Um, you want to make sure that your title is informative as possible with the fewest amount of words. Um, don't assume that your map readers, I like to say, you want to make sure your map can live without you standing there explaining. It needs to stand on its own. Author. So this one's pretty important, and you can see that um, you can do author in a couple different ways. My personal value, uh, opinion, just my opinion, is I don't ever really put my own name on any of the map products that I um, present. Garrett may do it completely different, but I very much feel like um, when I'm making a map, I am working for the organization or, or for the company or organization that I work for and that who is the owner of the map. I'm not in business for myself. Um, so I may put my name on there, but more often I actually don't. Um, I have a couple examples here. So basically who compiled it? Um, and if the data comes of another um, uh, entity was involved, you could kind of give them credit too. So maybe it's a multi-department um, uh, uh, effort. I will say um, that as we'll show with some of the examples later on, um, I often now do maps for an organization on behalf as my employment with Schneider. So I have, um, usually do some kind of combination of uh, credit to the organization that the map really belongs to, which is that county or city. But I also put the geos, uh, Schneider Geospatial logo on the map so they know that um, it was authored by someone outside of the county. I figure more information is is better than that, than less. We'll be talking about legends today. Um, legends are important. You know, you need to put the valuable information of what you're seeing with the symbols. Um, you want to try and make your symbols the same size as they are on the map. That's not as big a deal as it used to be. Um, and um, they can come in variety. And sometimes you may just need to do a legend of your primary information on the map. And the base map information is pretty evident. The world is pretty used to Google Maps and Google Earth and all the other mapping products that are out there. And so, you know, base map stuff is maybe not as important um, as it used to be in the legend, depending on what who your audience is and how the map's going to be used. And um, I think it's also important that um, I, I do err towards a legend if the idea is, um, if there's, especially if there's a lot of symbology on a map, um, there's a lot of bad map readers out there. And uh, like I always think like roads, um, even though a lot of people, you know, people drive, we see signs everywhere we go. You'd be surprised the number of people that really can't remember what the symbol for a U.S. highway is versus, say, a state highway or a county highway. So. Uh, anything you can help people become better map readers, that's important. Um, if you choose not to use a, a legend, if your map is simple enough or it's more dynamic in nature, um, make sure that you're paying attention to your labeling. That can kind of take the place of a legend in a lot of situations um, and make it more self-evident. And therefore, a legend may not be as necessary. Like I said, these are not hard and fast rules. These are just things to remember of. Um, this is an example where I didn't make a, a legend. It would have just cluttered up. It was actually an online map. Um, you've got the title and author and all that, but it was pretty evident of what it was with the title and um, we labeled it properly on the map so we didn't need the legend. Date, 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 date. Don't forget dates. Um, as you can tell, I think that's super important. I'm sure we've all looked at a map. You, we have information, you have owner names, you may have aerial photography, you have um, values, um, whatever you have on the map. Obviously, it's a snapshot in time. Things change, the earth change, rivers move, parcel boundaries change, ownership changes, et cetera, et cetera. So make sure that your map has a date um, and whether it be like printed date, last update, aerial photography flown, like whatever 
make sure the date is included. And if you can use dynamic text, which we'll be talking about for your date so that you don't have to remember to manually change it every time you print a new copy of the map or, or make some changes, it'll update automatically. Um, but make sure you include a date because it's the map is only as current as the moment in which it was made. Orientation, north arrow, pretty uh, obvious. North is almost always up, almost, but not necessarily. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of poor map readers out there, so you want to make sure and give them as much information um, as possible. I do have an example. This happens to be a map I made. Um, if Travis is on, he'll recognize this back in the day um, from Franklin County. Uh, this is a, a map of a property, and this is how they want it orientated because where the sign was, it was at the entrance of the property, and this is how you um, the property looked when you were standing looking at this map. Um, kind of like a mall map, you are here. Anyway, if um, down in the lower right, if you can see, the north is actually um, going to the right of the screen. So north is not up in this example. A grid. This one is just more to have to do with, um, you think of it as latitude and longitude when looking at like a world map. Um, often in counties, this is kind of a township and grid. Um, sometimes an inset map works for this. It's basically to help fig the person figure out where this map is in the world and some kind of locational information. Um, this is probably the most minor out of all of these in this um, little acronym, but it is something to think about. And in this case, this is also from Franklin County, happens to be. Uh, this is a very, very, very si tiny community that um, had great hopes and aspirations that never actually materialized. The map shows the area in red on the NSAP. You, the corporate limits are in yellow, so you can see where the people live is way inside the corporate limits. And if I were to zoom out and include the entire city, um, you would not actually be able to read all the street names. It is that. Um, it is that small of a community with that large of a corporate limits. So an inset map is super important. And then scale. Um, that's pretty self-evident too. So uh, usually that uh, becomes super important when um, dealing with surveys and land ownership uh, specifically. All right. So what we're going to do here is we're going to be kind of going to a demo. Uh, so bear with us as we kind of just go through things that we're going to be showing and um, uh, once, uh, like I said, um, when uh, we're done, we're going to make this video available. So if there's some little part that we go through fast that you want to do it or check again, you can rewind it. Before I begin, though, let me X out of this. Um, I did want to share one thing. So one of the things we talked about was um, disclaim or uh, uh, dates and ownership, and I did want to talk about disclaimers. That's not part of my little tall dogs. Um, well, acronym, but it kind of goes along with our author and I um, feel very strongly disclaimers are important to put on both web and um, online environments and paper maps and um, because people make a lot of assumptions and it's important for um, especially public entities to put out there that um, you know, we work on data in local government for particular purposes and um, and in following certain ordinances or laws or um, duties in public office. And that when you take that kind of data, raw data, and use it for other reasons, it may or may not always work for those purposes. And so I think there's um, and a good reminder that goes along with the author of the data that, you know, there could be errors and that, you know, nothing is perfect. And I think it's important for map readers to understand that. So um, I do have here some examples of I'm kind of a collector of disclaimers. And I know that some people struggle, especially um, people who haven't made as many paper maps or just haven't worked in this environment, um, sometimes struggle with the vocabulary to use. We're not lawyers. Um, those that have been in Iowa for a long time will recognize a lot of this language um, because it's we've been passing around some of this disclaimer language um, among different counties and cities for you know 20 years. And so sometimes just uh, getting the the language and vocabulary and ideas on how to present the information is half the battle. And so when I send out um, links to the video for this webinar, I'm also going to include this page. So if anyone is interested on some um, text for disclaimers, um, this could be a place to start. It's just, you know, suggestions. And I do have even an example here. This is one of my longer disclaimers. And this is um, was intended for like a zoning map. And so the disclaimer has to indicate that there's um, zoning maps that are set by county government with certain rules that it uses, like say parcel data and property data that has other um, 
uh, implied uses and the map was prepared by yet a third party. And so there's a lot of information to explain. Um, and so that information just kind of is con um, compact. And I have found that this has worked very well for me over the years. So I just want to throw that out as a, an extra part of a, of a layout. All right, so now we're going to go into demo time. So this is kind of a hodgepodge. And before I begin, um, does anyone have any questions? And um, if you do have a question, I, the chat is in a screen that I can't see. Please don't hesitate to speak up um, if you need to see something again, et cetera, et cetera. Like I said, um, we're kind of just going to be going through the idea that we're kind of doing here is um, kind of starting at the beginning on a layout and just making sure that people are familiar with um, Pro. Um, I know we have some new Pro users on there, and then we have a lot of experienced ArcMap users and a lot of experienced ArcGIS Pro. So if you see something um, that Garen and I maybe overlooked, as we all know, the more you use any piece of software, the more you realize that you're only on the tip of the iceberg and we're all creatures of habit. So um, many times uh, I will be doing something and someone will show me a different way to do it, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Um, all right, so working with ArcGIS Pro. So one of the first things that um, you might do if you don't start with an MXD and import is getting to um, the layouts. It's actually not open right away. Um, when you look in the catalog, and you first create a map, and I basically had to create this map because I wanted it to be in that scenario. There is no layout, and so you would insert, you have to go into the insert ribbon and go to a new layout and pick whatever um, that you want uh, to create. I'm going to do a letter size layout, and once you do that, it creates a layer, a layouts folder in your um, catalog, and from there on, that's always there. It's just the and the initial layout isn't there unless you've in, in, um, imported, and you would do that in the insert. By the way, import maps you can import in an MXD, and if you had a layout associated with that MXD, you would have that layouts folder. So that basically changes your ribbon at the top. Um, there's a layout ribbon now, and you've got um, a layout in your table of contents. You can uh, write uh, rename it at any time, so I could just call this. I have a tendency to call my stuff like Iowa um, layout, and I often will do this because when you end up having many, many layouts in your project with many, many maps, um, the size, sometimes you may have some layouts that are prepared at like a legal or 11 by 17 or larger size, some are letters, so I have a tendency to put size in the, and I like to word, use the word layout so that when I have maps open and I have layouts and you end up with a bunch of tabs at the bottom, I know immediately by looking at it, if um, from jumping from one tab to another, if I'm working in a map or uh, a layout. All right, so one of the things you can also do um, once you've uh, in the layout ribbon is you can work with your rules and your guides. So this can help you when you're putting all your map components together. Um, you can see I turned them both off and it's, it's pretty pretty naked. So um, the guides aren't evident um, right away, but when you have guides turned on, you can click on the ruler and you can insert guides at specific places. And so this just kind of helps you have some guidance if you are trying to fit, uh, maybe you're trying to stay inside a certain uh, white space or a, a gutter of a printing. Um, you wanna make sure that you are and I'm just right clicking and adding these guides. If they become nuisance or you want them to disappear, you can turn them off and, and do that. So that can be a handy way to help. Plus you can snap to those guides so that can help um, align and arrange your uh, uh, map elements. I will say compared to ArcMap, Pro does a great job of like aligning elements together um, with little um, kind of how like PowerPoint and other Microsoft products do. Like um, when you have two things lining them up, it kind of gives you some guides to snap on the fly, which I really, really appreciate. So those are your guides and your rulers. And um, and so just to enter or insert is where you basically do most of uh, populating your, your different elements on your layout. So the first thing I'm gonna do is, enter, um, is put in a map frame. So here, it, it kind of looks at what I've got and uh, you usually can see a little screenshot. It's a great place. You do have to draw your box on how, how big you want it to be by default if you're just starting. And of course, I'm just starting at the very bare bones. There's all kinds of ways to do this that we'll talk about. Um, and uh, 
So what I often like to do is get that. The first thing I always do is go into the properties and I just turn off my, um, my border. I just, sometimes I want a border, sometimes I don't, but when you're dealing with the entire state data, um, it's not something that I actually really appreciate. Let's say you don't want to use guides and you just want to know exactly where your, your map is. Maybe um, I'm sitting here and I just want to make sure uh, that the map is uh, centered on the page. I'm going to, first of all, um, as you notice, because I have um, my map frame on the table contents, I can still access, which is just fabulous. I can still access all my different layers and I'm going to zoom into the layer because I just want to make sure I'm zoomed in to, for the, my data frame is a, uh, or map frame, I should say, is zoomed in as possible for the state. And so one of the things I like to do, you can see that once I um, select it, I get a map frame uh, ribbon up here. And so on a line, they do have an align to page. So if I check that box um, and I go uh, choose to align center, it's going to align to the center of the page. And um, so therefore I know no matter what my guides are, um, my map is as centered as possible. And so that's kind of a nice way to know this um, is great with all your different elements if you do want them to be in the center and you don't have to just eyeball it. So there's your uh, map frame and then I can start entering um, your graphics and text is where you're gonna add most of your um, titles, your ribbon or um, your author, your date, all your text elements. So um, I can Let's see, what do I have? Uh, House of Representative. Okay, State of Iowa, or we all even just have a good title. Uh, a House, uh, U.S. House of Representatives. Now, most of you will appreciate the fact that it has spell check. Hallelujah. Um, I probably had my biggest cheer when Pro first came out, and it did have spell check. Um, just going to make that a little bigger. And then once again, because I still have it checked, um, oops, I got to go back and uh, grab my selection tool. Uh, since I still have it checked, I can align it to the center of the page. So as I moved here, I can sometimes I'm going to have problems with what is on top and what is on the bottom, or maybe um, you can arrange things. Um, in your layouts, you can also um, bring things forward in your orders, and you can also lock your map frame. So now, no matter how hard I try, I can't um, select it. So that's um, a good option if it's kind of frozen in place um, and you want to be able to deal with other elements around your um, map frame. Um, sometimes, uh, and if you need to turn it off for whatever reason, you can also uncheck it. Sometimes I'll use that for, um, I'll have alternative text and I'll have both of them on the same layout and I just um, toggle them on visible and um, not visible um, to jump between the two. So, and then the other one besides I, the text box you'll use the most is rectangular text. And that allows you to have basically a uh, dynamic uh, text window that you can use to resize um, your text and move it around. Also, um, a very nice option. So you would use that to do your different, um, your north arrows, you know, it's, it's very stylized. Um, I can tell you from my cartography days that usually the bigger maps are the ones that use the fancier um, compass rows and your more simple maps use the simple arrows, but really it's like um, dealer's choice. Um, when adding a scale bar, you have lots and lots of options and you'll find people kind of gravitate towards the same ones um, for all creatures of habits. I usually like to use the alternating. I don't know why, it's just the one I find the most pleasing. Um, the first thing I do though is I'm not usually a big fan of the automatic um, uh, scale bar. It just never usually shows the numbers that I want to show. And so I usually handle that. Um, as you can see, when I select the scales, I, um, the scale um, scale bar element window comes open and you can make changes. And usually what I like to do is on the second uh, window, I like to, instead of adjust it, I like to adjust the number of divisions. And then I can control, let's say I want it to be every 50 miles, then I can control it. And as I make my scale bar bigger and smaller, it's always gonna stay in the 50 um, or uh, mile, miles. Um, Bar. So that's a little change that I like to do. Now, 
it, that it can be challenging when you use with a map series or you might um, where you have your scale changing um, dramatically. Um, you have to be careful because then it uh, your scale bar can either uh, disappear or it can become so large that it'll go off the page. Um, but that's a challenge that you have no matter what kind of map series. So you might want to leave it um, a, adjust the division value if you have a um, are doing a map series with a, a variable scale that changes quite a bit. Um, and then you can kind of control. There's just so much control is haven't really changed much since ArcMap. Um, and you can even decide if you want them on the bar, below the bar, um, however it is that you want to arrange it. Um, it's all personal preference. It's kind of like decorating, you know, you want things to be balanced and easily readable, but pleasant to the eye. Um, let's see. So the other, let's see, Northern and then legend. So the legend, um, I'm just going to pick a basic legend here, just kind of squeeze it in. We're going to be talking about legends um, here shortly. Garrett's going to be doing that, um, but I just want to kind of show, oh boy, um, he's going to be talking about how you can control these. Of course, I picked something that has an incredible amount of uh, districts, so you can see that the little dot 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 means that I um, have legend running off the page, and so um, obviously we would want to uh, control for that. So I'm just going to do that and do that kind of curious to see how much i've got i've got a lot this is a terrible legend um boy so there is a lot you can do with a legend and i'm going to let garrett get into that um but uh i will offer out there um if you get stuck on legends and want to um, deal more into it um do reach out to us afterwards um after what garrett goes through um because of um the uh, the nature of legends um there's so much control that you can do as i'm clicking here you can control all the different aspects of your legend including um deciding how many columns you want you have in your legend and which layers you want to show up in each column so there's a lot of customization but before i do that i'm going to jump over to a different project one that i have a little bit more finished um i did want to show this um couple things when we've been adding all the elements on a, a layout, they're showing up in your drawing order on your uh, table of contents over here. And one of the things I love and I really appreciate is that you can have layers on in your map frame and you can choose whether or not you want them to show up in your legend. So all my layers, when I initially um, add the legend here, let me go grab a selection tool. When I grab, um, when I have my legend, I have lots of layers in my map. Some are turned on and some aren't, um, but I've only selected to have a few turned on in the table of contents. So this is one of those cases where um, I, if you zoom in, I've got little building footprints and I've got a couple roads um, showing in this map and um, I'm choosing not to put them in the legend um, for two reasons. It's kind of a base map. Um, it's just a base map background. Um, the primary subject of this map is the, the different snowplow routes. And so I don't want anything to take away from the focus of that. And these maps were also created for the staff of the snowplow routes. So the audience knows the roads, they know the purpose of this map, um, and they don't need the labeling and or all the line work cluttering up um, either on the map or in the legend. So I wanted to keep the legend as simple as possible. And so I just picked um, to include the um, the symbols that were the most important on the map, the cul-de-sacs, the dead ends, and the different labeled routes. So that's one thing I wanted to point out um, that you can, uh, if I wanted to have road center lines, I can check it and then it, they will show up, but it can add a lot of complication. You can see here, there's a lot of different kinds of symbology for the roads. Um, and so by turning them off, it keeps it simple. The other parts I wanna show on this map is we've added a logo. Um, so a logo, when you bring it in is uh, is a great way to add ownership to a map, bring a little color, um, web designers, uh, cities, you know, they have seals, they have logos, um, and it really helps identify a map um, as belonging to your organization. Once again, there's a lot of bad map readers or they don't understand where the maps are coming from or who's producing them. So it's important to have um, uh, good uh, identifying marks on it. You would insert a logo in the same place that you would insert graphics. You would pick the picture. You can uh, insert a picture and you can see that it's looking for all your basic image um, files. 
and I have a tendency to, let's see what I've got here. Uh, and my, so in Indianola, I've got a couple different um, logos that I use. And actually, I think they're here. Yeah. Uh, there's even a, like, here's the fire department logo. So one of the tricks, and this actually took me a little while, I used to think that you had to draw a box or something when you insert your logo, kind of like when you insert a map frame. But if you just click on the screen, it's going to add it. Now, this, uh, whoops, this logo is enormous. You can see that it is just huge. So that's not a great option. So the other thing you can do, I'm going to delete that and I'm going to insert it again and show you a different option. If I go and pick that enormous logo, I can also draw a box and say I want it to fit inside that space. So that's good and bad um, a way of handling it. You can see that it just fits it into the box I drew and I've got a little bit of extra white space, but that um, is a way to handle what is obviously a huge file. Um, and it could be quite cumbersome to bring in a logo that's basically sizing larger than the paper that you're um, layout that you're working on. So that's one option that she can do. If I was making a map for, um, boy, this thing is so big, it's it's not even hardly, I hope it doesn't crash my software just because it's enormous. Um, it might, goodness, I'm going to turn that off. Um, one of the things, though, it does just call it a picture. And so over in your table of contents, you'll want to... Um, Definitely take some time to, um, if I double click into the properties, you can do it kind of, you can fill out the information. It shows you where the path is and um, the name. And so I can do fire department logo. And um, as you can see, as you start getting more and more elements of your map uh, and your table of contents, it can be very helpful if you use, um, you name your uh, different elements. I've got my disclaimer down here uh, in box here and you can text and copy and paste text. So if you've got it somewhere else, you can copy and paste it. And I have a logo um, there. Um, I think at this point, I am gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna turn it over to Garrett and um, let him kind of take over. And awesome. over there. let's see here, do you believe this is it? So hopefully, can everybody hear me? I guess I'll just start off with that. Yep, we can. Hopefully Micah doesn't give me uh, too much crap as I have not had time to get my cartography on too much with some of the examples that we're gonna run through. Um, but one of the biggest questions I think that we usually get is how can we generate not only a good looking map, but have it look similar and do it within a time frame across different, let's say geospatial boundaries, whether that be school districts, commissioner districts, um, whether that's creating our own index grid. Um, and for those of you that do know, or you used them in ArcMap before, um, we'd have something called data-driven pages. The way that that is in ArcGIS Pro is that they are now called map series, um, which is what gives us the ability to center our map frame across some boundary that we are wanting to identify certain information from. Um, so it's a very powerful tool. Um, the example that I'm gonna run through today um, is uh, Steuben County, Indiana. I pulled some of their data over onto my local machine, so that way hopefully it'll run a little bit faster. Um, and we're just gonna look at generating maps for the different school district boundaries. So, let's see here. The first thing I did was of course, pulled in all of that data and information. Um, and I guess before we get too much into the data driven pages, I think the first thing we're going to take a look at is a little dive into a little bit more of the legend, um, which will help relate to once we start running through some of the data driven pages. But the big, let's see if I can't move that. When we are adding our legend to the map, I think the biggest thing is when we go in to start adjusting some of these elements, is figuring out what those elements are. So when I've inserted this, legend in here, we have all of our different layers that are in our map, but when we go in to start adjusting some of these elements within our layout, through this drop down, we'll see a bunch of these different names. We have our legend, background, border, border, shadow, title. So whenever we are in our layouts table of contents and we're clicked on the legend, legend heading, that's when we can adjust some of the border, the background, um, general themes across the entire legend. Um, so if I wanted to add a 
border, which of course sometimes we need to for our legends. We'll add the border. We'll make it white. I will say a lot of times we'll see that it adds it directly on that edge. Of course, we'd like to have a little bit of gapping. So this is when I usually come into here and add a little bit of gapping. Um, that's where we can adjust some of the general legend style settings. What I want to get into, though, is more on these individual elements within each one of these layers that are within the school district map. Um, so if we were to focus just on school districts here in general, when I look at school districts in the map that's within this layout, back into my school district frame, we see we have school districts, districts, which is what it is being symbolized on based on the category, and then, of course, each one of those districts that is within that layer. If I wanted to adjust those within this legend, we have to identify what those elements are within um, that grouping itself. So I will say most of the time I have to click through here and just keep adjusting things until it adjusts what I want it to. Um, but I can at least go over what they are now um, from the years of experience of just clicking through and, and increasing text, removing text. Um, but our legend item, those are always going to be whatever it is being symbolized on um, within the map. So our legend items are going to be the boxes off to the sides of whatever our feature is. Let's see here, was there a question? Is that what that beep was? Maybe. No, no, no question. But does the, okay. not just boxes, but if it's a point symbol, it'd be a point, right? Yep. Yep, yep, points, lines, uh, so polygons, points, lines, um, any of those, that's where that gets adjusted within that legend item. Most of the time, what you'll find, what you're needing to adjust with this is the patch width and height. Um, this is where you can then come in and say, if it's 40, 35, you'll see if I hit enter, it'll start to make those bigger or smaller based on how you want that sizing to be. I'm gonna hit undo. I like the general sizing of what it was at first. Um, that's where we start to adjust some of that. Um, the next thing we're going to see is our group layer names. If in our map we created group layers, a lot of times what I find myself doing with that is if I'm um, labeling a road data set and I'm grouping the roads because I have it queried out into interstates, um, private roads, county roads, I'll group those all together. And if I want that to show up within the legend that it's a group data set, um, it'll be within that group layer name. Or what you can do is also group those within your legend itself in the table of contents. Um, oh, maybe not in the table of contents. That would be in at your actual map frame. If I were to group different features together, that's what that element is within the legend. The next thing is going to be the layer name, which I think is the only one that makes the most sense, which is the layer name itself. So if I were to adjust some of the font sizing for layer name, we'll see that school districts for the one that I have highlighted is going to start to increase. Then we can go into our headings, which your headings are going to be, um, I'm symbolizing school districts based on district. So if I were to increase the text of this, it's going to be um, what it's telling me uh, the category is that I'm symbolizing on. Um, for this specific case, I left it there. If I were to actually have this in a map, because the layer name is school districts, I think that it's uh, it's not important to have that labeled there and to save on space. I would usually get rid of that because I know that these are the school districts anyway. But I left it in there just so that way we could see what that element was within the legend itself. Next thing we'll get into is I'll for just one second. Yeah, um, there is an option if you highlight the word legend just, uh, over in your table of all contents, of and then you can um, under uh, under, let's see, uh, the properties. I'm sorry, you have to go to the main properties of the legend. So right mouse click and go to the properties. If you go to the second tab over, uh, or wait, maybe it's the first tab. I'm sorry, first tab and then show properties there in the middle. You can uncheck layer name and or headings and it just won't show them. And it'll do that for all of your elements in the legend. So if you know you're never going to show the layer name and you just want it to be labels, you can just uncheck the word label layer name and it'll make them disappear for everything. And on that same note, that's the same thing that I'd be doing too for all of the um, legend items themselves. Because typically for most of it, if I want my corp limits, political townships, 
school districts, I really want those boxes for the most part to always be the same size um, to be consistent. So I would usually highlight the entire legend and then you can go into the element itself and change, oh, is that not property? That's where it was, properties and change it for the entire set of features within the legend. Um, so that way you're not going through one by one and adjusting those. The next thing, of course, is the labels, which is going to be the infra, what it's describing off the side of the um, layer item, um, the legend item itself, um, saying what type of county it is, whether it's political townships, corp limits. And then the description is if you had descriptions within those um, labels themselves, that's where we would adjust that. So that's what each one of those elements are within the legend. Um, the other thing that I'd like to go over to with the legend itself is what I find sometimes is occasionally if I were to add another feature to my map itself and I went into my catalog and say, I really wanted to add sections to this because I wanted to start marking sections. And we'll just quickly go no fill on this. What it does sometimes is it will add it to the legend. Sometimes that will not get added to the legend. So if I were to remove this and you want to add something to the legend, you can come down into your map frame and pull, if it opens, I need more space on my screen. And pull it up into the legend itself so that way it'll add that feature if for some reason it had not populated it. Before I realized I could do that, I would just end up creating a new legend so that way it would repopulate it off that refresh map, um, map frame. Um, but that's how we would then get it added back into that legend. Um, trying to think of some other things. The other thing too, of course, is um, Sometimes if you have uh, wetlands or lakes or some sort of river feature and you don't want it to be that standard box, um, what we would do in that case is if you add that feature to your map and you went into the symbology of that feature itself, within this symbol section, you can change what you want that to look like. So most wetlands are gonna be fairly rounded, so I want that one to be rounded. My corp limits usually are sometimes boxes. Say I want it to be kind of more of a, a jagged polygon. What that'll then do is within your legend itself, it'll also reestablish those to follow um, kind of how you have that polygon line or point set up um, within your map. Um, just to give more of that, that aesthetic um, to your layout. Before I move on to map series, Micah, is there anything else that you would want to touch on within Legends? I think you may be muted. I, I am, most definitely. Um, maybe showing how you can switch to manual columns. Oh, yeah. So within our Legend, if you have ones, are you talking about selecting out specific features you want to be in a single column? Yeah, I, I and I'm not even sure the way you do it. I usually go in and um, go into the legend properties and and pick manual columns first. Um, is as my way of uh, doing it, and then I kind of move things around the columns. See, and and this is this is the GIS a thousand different ways to do things. So oh, I'm really yeah, I'm curious yeah. To see what you're going to do here. Because I would usually I would select out what I would want to be in individual columns, and then I would usually try to hit keep in a single column. Um, what I have been doing here recently because I don't like the way that it formats the legend when you assign it to a column in the way it has legends. Sometimes what I'll do is I will copy out my legend and just assign the features that I want. So that way I can maneuver where exactly I want those to line up. Okay, so have you created columns where you do it totally manually? Have you done that before? No. Okay, um, collect, uh, select a legend in, um, and go to the properties again, uh, that show properties there on the right, on your, uh, yeah. And under, um, wait, you have to have the word legend. Um, selected. Yep. And, oh, I'm sorry. 2nd column right there. Yep. From there. 
uh, drop down, you pick um, in the middle, adjust columns and nope in the middle and go down to manual columns. And then you say how many you want right now you have 1 and you want to pick like 2 or 3. And you can see here, you've got columns now, and you can drag them into which column you want them in. But you also have to make your box. Um, you have to spread it out and give enough room for you to have those columns. So it's yeah. kind of a twofold. Um, you still have to have a legend space big enough to handle the multiple columns, but that's how you can control um, what um, map layers are in which column. Okay. I have found, as, as Garrett's messing here, I have found, and I'm sure you most of you have found, sometimes messing with legends and getting it to look the way you want on a complicated large map um, can be some of the most frustrating and deep dive stuff that you'll do <laughs> in um, ArcGIS Pro. I found um, layouts as a whole to be um, have the most learning curve and the deep dive into the minutia of how you control your different elements to get the look you want or the look that the person you're making the map for wants. Because I'm sure we've all been in places where we're like, good enough for us. And then the person who you're presenting the map to has some requests that are very specific um, and dealing with legends and the um, and layouts to be uh, the place it can get the most complicated. Sure, for sure. So if um, like, if you have any questions on legends or there's anything else, definitely send a message into the chat. What I'm gonna move on to with the last little bit of time we have is map series. Um, so in order to generate the map series, you have to have some sort of boundary defining feature. So that way the map frame knows where to center itself on. Um, in this case, I'm going to be using school districts. So I already have my map set up. What I want to do is I want to come up here, which is in the insert tab when I'm in my layout um, uh, section within ArcGIS Pro. I want to go to spatial. I want to create a map series. I want it to use the current map frame that's within my layout, which is this map frame, not, an, not the overview. I want to use school districts. The field name that I want to use is school districts. So if I click okay on that, and then we refresh that, what this is then going to do in this tab here is it's going to create a series of maps that is then centered on um, those individual school districts that I have here. And as I click through these, as you'll see, it'll center it based on those school districts within the county. What we can also do, which what we find sometimes is, yes, it's centered on Prairie Heights School, but say I really don't want to see these other school districts in here. I want them to only see the purple outline that says it's Prairie Heights Community School. What we can do within our map is we can set up page queries, which is in the properties of the layers within your map. You can right-click, properties, page query at the bottom, I want to set this to school district and what this will do is it says if my um, map series is says that I'm going to be generating a map centered on Prairie Heights school. If Prairie Heights school matches the name of what it is within the school district field within that it will it will basically add like a definition query to just that layer. So now we can see in our map. I currently have my map series click for Prairie Heights school and it created a uh, on the fly definition query for just the Prairie Heights polygon. If I were to come in here and then click the Fremont, and I went back into my map frame, it creates that on the fly definition query for Fremont. What we end up finding this um, being used for a lot of times is if um, there's, there's features outside of what you want to show. Um, a lot of times when I'm picking up, say, routing boundary for parcel data set, I only want to show the parcels that are within that routing boundary. I don't want to show anything out of it. So what I what I do is add that page query um, to the parcel data set for anywhere that it has the routing boundary e equal to a certain number. Same thing if it was sections. If I had section numbers within my parcel data set and I was running a map series on sections, if they both equaled within the map series, it would filter and only show parcels that were within that area. Um, a lot of times the data doesn't already have it in there. That's where we start to have to run spatial joins and creating a field that's our map, uh, map series ID, um, which 
I think would be awesome for another topic is to go in depth on kind of generating some more of those out of the box map series that we don't quite have time for for today. Um, but we can create these map series that creates these set of maps. What I always like to hit on within map series is the use of dynamic text. So that way our maps are labeling based on what is going on. So here we can see how I have my Steuben County, Indiana school districts, but the title is automatically updating for whatever district it is centering on. In order to get that into our map frame, what we can do is we can start to use our dynamic text. And what you'll see is if you scroll down a little bit, we have a map series section right here. And I'm going to use it based on my page name because my page name is set up to be the name of that school district. What I'll do a lot of the time, since I'll usually already have a title in, is I'll just add that to my map. I'll click into the data element and I will grab what it says the dynamic text needs to be. So I'll copy that and I'll just add that into a section that I have for titles. So I'll just add that there. And of course now it's gonna double up. So that way I can have it into my title. I just, I can't remember how the dynamic text needs to be formatted every time. I do the same thing when I look at export, date exported, if I have that added on a map. I'll have to go in and figure out how to format the dynamic text to be the correct date format, whether I want 08, 10, 2024, um, or it fully spelled out. Hey, um, so um, uh, if you double click on that, uh, Garrett, on the word name there, just to show people, you can see the code that it's using. If you need to uh, change it for something else in the future, that's how I learned how it was pulling what it was pulling. Yep, yep. So, that changes my title, that gives me my schools. Um, what I see, I have an inset here with the time that we don't, I don't think that that is necessarily important to go over. I think the next thing to really go over at the map series is exporting these out. Um, Actually, the Garrett, I'm gonna stop you right there. So, haha, <laughs> we're almost out of time, which I am so not surprised. And I I think um, that we there's enough stuff and instead of flying through it, um, I'm going to reserve exporting, sharing, um, Templates, PDFs, and maps for another session. Um, I'm just going to leave them wanting more uh, because there's a lot of stuff that we haven't even that we wanted to talk about that we haven't even gotten into, including dynamic text. I would like to talk about creating a map series from scratch. Uh, a lot of times, people see one and it's finished, and they um, but they may not know how to exactly get started from absolute white piece of paper, um, yeah. stuff like that. So I don't want you to feel like you have to rush through, Garrett. Okay. Okay. You can take a breather. You're good. Yeah. Yep. Um, one of the things do you, did you plan to talk on Garrett that you're not, um, uh, that you didn't get to, um, things that you have found to be useful. Um, definitely uh, 1 thing that I'd like to go into with you get individuals from more of an engineering background requesting maps. What we find, and this is more of just a plug for what I think would be important for another session, is to start to look at generating maps that have um, like uh, page lines. Pair this line up with this line. So what I get that request for a lot, see if I can't bring it up, which has to go with also rotating your maps to be able to fit the page the best. Um, and I'm trying to see if I can't find an example of one. There's some on that, but that's, so think of like CAD drawings and, but using GIS to generate those CAD drawings. Um, the other thing, let's see, I got so many tabs up. I don't know, definitely the sharing and exporting a map series. That's super important, but that'll be for another one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I honestly think we could do an entire session on just maps. Indexing series. grids, yeah. using yep. fish nets to be able to generate map series that don't actually have a specific feature that has a boundary, but more of we just want to hone in on equal areas within the county. What'd you that call that? Thing. A fishnet. I never heard that phrase before. I think that's what it's, I think that's what the tool's called too, if I'm generating a fishnet. <laughs> so, um, to be able to break up the county into equal areas and just be yeah, able yeah. to- Yeah, yeah, I've always called it an index grid. Yeah, yeah, very similar <laughs> thing, Maybe yeah. it's an Indiana thing. <laughs> tables, you, having your tables within the map um, work off of your map series, I think is also another important one. Mm -hmm. There's just 
there's so much, there's little nuances to map series that make your life a lot easier afterwards, but can be a bit difficult getting things formatted at first. Okay, so yeah, um, so those in the audience, we're definitely going to be doing a map series. I've got enough notes right here um, because I've done a good chunk of what um, Garrett's talking about. And um, I see Dave Kroll is piping up about some stuff too. So, um, oh, you have another fishnet vocabulary person, Garrett. You're not the only one. Oh, do I? <laughs> That's a, I just love that phrase. And then seriously, I've never, when you said that, I'm like, wait, what? Um, also, you showed me something today. I am today years old, kind of learning it. I did not know that in the layout, you could drag it from the made of, the layer from the a map frame into the legend. That's new to me. So, um, I think it's um, great. Go ahead, Garrett, and ask about templates. I'm a, I'm a light user about of templates. Um, I don't know, Garrett, have you used templates in, very much? Um, I've played around with them, but I haven't been serious about them. Like but, setting but, up ArcGIS Pro project templates or layout templates? Well, it, good question. Layout. Get, go ahead. Yeah, layout, layout templates. So I have, I've created, you know, C size, D size, E size, letter, legal, all the, the templates for layouts, but I want to, you know, I've saved those. Uh, it's kind of a two part question. One in the, in the map properties, the, um, you have to select the map that it associates within the layout. Is there a way to like make that dynamic so that whatever map or project you bring it into, it automatically defaults to the map that's in that project? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, like, I, I exported it out of one project to have for employees to bring in to print out of, but I, I'm having to show them, okay, you have to go into the properties and then you have to change the map frame to match the map that's in your project. Is there a way to make that dynamic that you know of to set it to just automatically connect whatever map is in your project? I think so, because I know I kind of was messing around with that and it, it not only brought in the, the layout, but it also brought the map frame in too, didn't it? Yeah, I, yeah. and I have, honestly, I have a couple of those templates that if you open up the map frame properties and you look at it, it has like eight or nine different map frames that you can select and it actually references out of the project to that map that I'm like, I don't even know where that data is coming from, but it's still referencing that map. So I do think I'm just playing around as you were talking um, yeah. and I did just open up uh, an empty art pro project and just enter I inserted a layout and then I inserted a map frame. I don't even have a map in this project. Yeah. And it did put a map frame in there. So you might be able to do that, like get rid of your map and then it'll bring it still bring it in blank and they'll still have to associate it, but at least they won't have to remove an existing one. Yeah. I, that's the second part of my question is can I go into a saved like template uh or a layout template or uh layout yeah, layout template and remove old map frames from it so that I can filter that yes. down because it won't let you do that. And then you end up having a list of like 18 different yeah. map frames within it. So I was hoping there was a way to. I would start that with default. a completely as bare bones possible yeah. project and then just use that to export your template um, yeah. because otherwise okay. I think you're going to have that problem. Yeah. Okay. okay. At least that that's been my experience. But like I said, I'm a very poor user of templates. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm still old school enough. I still have that brain of map documents where I just open up an existing map document and do a save as, which is yeah. not a great habit to have with pro uh, uh -huh. at all. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so I, I do see we're, we're at one. So I do want to wrap things up. Garrett, I want to say thank you so much for uh, jumping in here uh, you um, and, and showing your knowledge. I'm always so impressed with um, what you do. And also to let if people know in the chat, Josh has put a link in there. If you're not currently a member of IJIC and you wish to join our email list, go ahead and click on that link in the chat um, to get all in the know. Um, I know we did not cover near all the things I wanted to cover. I'm not surprised. Um, so there will be, I think, I think the first part of 2024 may just be ArcGIS Pro um, 101 new topic every month for the first five months because with the sun setting of going into maturity for ArcMap, I, I know a lot of people are who haven't quite 100% made the leap into pro are probably feeling a little bit of the pressure so that it seems very timely. Um, so, uh, does anyone have any other questions before we end? Okay. 
Well, I thank everybody for joining. Our next Lunch and Learn is going to be, and I always never am prepared for this, the 21st of February. So it's going to be at noon on the 21st. We'll have, um, I think I am going to do map series. I'm, I'm showing my hand here because uh, we have so many different topics we're going to cover with that. And um, Dave, I will be reaching out to you just so you know. Heads up. Uh, all right. So thank you so much and uh, stay warm out there, guys.